<laughs> Maybe we could shift to the welcome screen. Yeah. <laughs> the, the cows are good, but they, they, there's only so much of that that you can look at. <laughs> Uh, the worship this morning has been extremely fitting because this morning I wanted to speak about Jesus as the greatest king. And so um, this morning I want to start with reading 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verses 1 to 14. After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. But that night, the word of, the God, the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says, You are not the one to build me a house to dwell in. I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israel up out of Egypt to this day. I have moved from one tent site to another from one dwelling to a place to another. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their leaders whom I commanded to shepherd my people, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will subdue all your enemies. I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take away my love from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Holy Spirit, would you come today? Would you fall in power? Would you reveal and would you open the word to us as we read it and as we study it this morning in Jesus' name? Now, the immediate fulfilment of the prophecy given by the prophet Nathan to the King Daniel is pretty obvious. King David went on to, to, to conquer and to subdue all of the known enemies of Israel in existence at that time, and he built an extremely powerful empire in the Middle East. David had a son called Solomon, who built a house which was the magnificently beautiful first temple. Solomon's temple was built over a period of seven years with the help of extremely um, skilled and qualified artisans and tradesmen. And under Solomon, the kingdom that his father David had uh, established became exceedingly prosperous. And it's actually recorded that he made gold as common as the dust on the streets. However, we see only a partial fulfillment of the, this prophecy in David's son Solomon. Solomon reigned as a king over Israel for 40 years and then he died and was buried. Solomon's son Rehoboam rejected the good advice of the elders who had served as advisors to Solomon and as a result, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel formed their own kingdom, leaving only two tribes to the inheritance of the line of David. In time, the kingdom of Israel, which was the ten breakaway tribes, was absolutely wiped off the face of the earth by the Assyrians. And just over a century later, the kingdom of Judah, 
which was the two tribes left to the inheritance of David, was conquered by the Babylonians and it was taken into captivity. And while that captivity only lasted for about 70 years and the people were allowed to return to their homeland, they never again had their own king. And they say that hindsight is always 2020. And with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that this prophecy of David, or given to David, the prophecy given to David in Chronicles chapter 17 of a house and a kingdom lasting forever is actually fulfilled in its entirety in Jesus Christ. From verse 11, when your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. I will never take away my love from him as I took it away from your predecessor. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. Jesus was born into the tribe of Judah, of the kingly line of David, and he will reign forever. Revelation 1, 17 and 18 tells us, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, now I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus built a temple or a church which has been transforming individuals, and those individuals go on to transform culture. And those transformed cultures go on to transform nations. In Daniel 2, 31 to 35, we read, Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue. So this is when Daniel was interpreting the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar refused to give that, um, to tell the dream to his enchanters and his magicians and his wise men. He demanded that they tell him the dream and its interpretation. So Daniel, having prayed and been given that, uh, the dream and the interpretation by God, is now explaining it. So the king saw an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. The head, the Babylonian Empire, was defeated by the silver chest of the Persian Empire, which itself was defeated by the bronze fires of the Greek Empire, which in turn was defeated by the mixed iron and clay feet of the Roman Empire, which was then defeated by the rock. <laughs> cut with our hands, which is Jesus Christ, his gospel and his church. The church of Jesus is the rock that went on to become a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ has been gaining strength for 2,000 years and it will last for eternity. When Jesus rose from the dead, the Father gave him the kingdom. For all eternity, Jesus is head of the church and king of the kingdom of God. And in 1 Timothy 1.17, the apostle Paul is in the middle of a sentence and he can't help but interject in his own sentence and say, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we know that it was foretold that Jesus was to be a prophet like Moses. In Deuteronomy 18, 17 to 19, God said to Moses, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. 
he will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. And Jesus was also to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Assuming I'm saying that name roughly correct because I know there's a few different pronunciations. <laughs> the kingly role of Jesus in the Old Testament prophecies is centred around the figure of King David. Sometimes the reference is to raising up a king from the line of David as in Jeremiah 23 verse 5. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. Other times, the reference makes it sound like the Messiah would be King David himself raised to life, as in Ezekiel 37, 23 and 24. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and there will be one shepherd for all of them. They will follow my ordinances and keep and observe my statutes. And Ezekiel here is writing hundreds of years after King David was already dead and buried. But the similarity with John 10 is striking and, clear, and it's clear that Jesus is the subject of the prophecy. And while King David was a shepherd of sheep, Jesus is a shepherd to his people, just like Ezekiel prophesied in the reference that we just read. Jesus referred to himself as a shepherd, and more specifically, as the good shepherd. Jesus says in John 10, The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. And then he identifies the shepherd. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. Now I've had really nothing to do with sheep other than petting one and enjoying lamb chops for dinner and woolly <laughs> jumpers in winter. But while I don't have personal experience with raising sheep, I do have a little bit of experience with uh, raising cattle and uh, I don't expect that sheep, for the purposes of my exercise, are too much different to uh, raising cattle. Yeah, I know there's a few raised eyebrows, but... <laughs> <laughs> sheep do not serve the shepherd. The shepherd serves the sheep. Sheep have no ability to take care of the shepherd or to perform tasks for the shepherd. The shepherd feeds the sheep, cares for the sheep, and protects the sheep. Even though there are things in which the sheep can add value to the shepherd, such as wool, milk, and meat, the sheep itself cannot do anything to hand those products over. The shepherd still has to do the work to harvest and prepare those products. Shepherd or whatever other process is involved, the sheep doesn't do it itself. Jesus is the servant king in his portrayal as shepherd. And Liz spoke about Jesus' role as servant last week. In John 13, 12 and 13, we read, When Jesus had washed the feet, or washed their feet, and put on his outer garments, he reclined with them again and asked, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, because I am. 
So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Truly, truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who holds the keys of death and Hades, served his disciples or his students. If Jesus served his students, then you and I should be happy to serve each other. Jesus said in the verse we just read out, if you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. To natural human minds, serving does not necessarily sound like a source of blessing. Doing or acting on the word is part of renewing our minds and by deliberately and actively serving our brothers and sisters, we will find that the blessings Jesus speaks of become real to us. Now I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. And if you already know the scripture, I'm actually going to attempt to read it in the context that Paul claims that he wrote it in. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So in this scripture, I believe we find that it's actually in Jesus' best interest to serve his people. Verse 25 starts out, Jesus gave himself up for his church, and that is you and I, to make us holy. Holiness is in Jesus' very nature. It's what he wants around him, and it's what he wants more than anything in those who are dear to him. You and I are the church, and the church is Jesus' bride, and the more holy you and I are, the more attractive we are to Jesus. There is a circular kind of reasoning or reality happening here where the holier we become, the better our relationship with Jesus becomes and therefore the better and more joyful our life becomes. The more holy we become, the more one we become with Jesus. And the more one we become with Jesus, the more our prayers match what is on his heart and the more our prayers match what is on his heart, the more prayers we get answered, which means we have more joy. Jesus wants nothing more than for his bride, and that's us, to ask for things that he can give us and to see us joyful as he grants our requests. Verse 26 continues, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. The bride on her wedding day is radiant, having made herself absolutely beautiful. She's full of joy and she's dressed in the finest white materials, 
not a single hair out of place. And she's holding beautiful flowers that will appear that appear to have come straight out of heaven. Well, at least that's my recollection of my <laughs> wedding day to Liz. The husband, that's me in this case, is speechless in awe because he has never seen anything so beautiful as his bride walking down the aisle towards him. This is the picture of what Jesus wants for us, his bride. Jesus, the servant king, has paid the highest price for us and he has served, working tirelessly with his own hands to ensure that we are the most beautiful, holy, joyful bride that has ever been seen or ever will be seen. And from verse 28 it finishes, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Jesus' love for us does not diminish as time goes by. And Jesus never gets focused on a project in the shed and forgets to show us the, the love that he has for us in ways that we understand. Jesus works on the principle that the happier we are, the happier he is. Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit to ensure we become more holy and therefore more happy every day. We, the bride, have to surrender to Jesus and to submit to him. Jesus will not force his gifts or his joy onto us. If what Jesus is offering does not look like the best of gifts and the greatest of joys, then we need to ask the Holy Spirit to open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears and to circumcise our spiritual hearts. And of course, this is a project. We are an ongoing transformation. We don't get zapped into holiness. It's something that we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through study and reading of the Word and prayer and devoting ourselves to spending time in Jesus' presence. So we're all at different levels, but as long as we're on the journey, that's where Jesus wants us to be. You've probably heard it said of someone that they're too heavenly-minded or holy to be of any earthly use. Now, it may well be that the person in question is of little earthly use. However, the issue is not that they are too holy. Holy people are those who are obeying Jesus' commands and who are serving just like Jesus, our servant king, demonstrated. Jesus is the greatest king, the king of kings, the lord of lords, and the one who holds the keys of death and Hades. Do you want to be king? Do you want to be great? Jesus said, whoever wants to be gr become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We have been commissioned by Jesus to rule with him as ser in this life as servants. He gave us authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to cleanse lepers, and to raise the dead. He told us that, when, uh, that what we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He told us that if we forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven, and if we do not forgive their sins, they are not forgiven. Jesus told us that because he was going back to the Father, we who believe in him would not only do the works that he did, but even greater works we will do. Now, if that's not reigning, I don't know what is, but we're servants while we're doing it. Servants are the people with great power and influence in the kingdom of God. And servants in the kingdom of God have the greatest joy, fulfillment, and sense of purpose. 
Father, would you just open our spiritual eyes so that we may see? And would you open our spiritual ears so that we may hear? May we understand what it is, that joy that Jesus has offered us in being a servant. And would you show us the power that is available when we submit to Jesus Christ as our King? And Father, would you just transform the communities that we live in as we, your people, learn to become servants, first to each other and then those around us. And I thank you, Father, that there is power to transform each and every one of us into those people that Jesus saw in his mind's eye as he offered himself up on the cross. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power and your presence in each and every one of us. I thank you for the power to live holy lives and to be Christ Jesus' witnesses here in Blackall and to the ends of the earth. Amen. 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 I'll hand back over to Rachel for a closing song.